Amen. You may be seated as you're seated, kids. Yes, you get to go now. You get to go out to Kids Quest and learn more about Jesus. We're so thankful for you. We love you. Let me take this opportunity to say thank you for those who continue to support God's ministry that's going on here in the life of First Church. Uh, we're so grateful for your generosity. You know, Mike and uh, Brian just got back from Romania and Ireland, and uh, you know, things go there in Romania, a uh, place that I've never been to, but the ministry of the De Silva's there, uh, one of their ministries is amongst the uh, gypsy people. And um, they have a wood shop there that they, that they uh, mentor and help these young men learn this trade. And while they were there, they had three thousand dollars worth of the wall tools stolen. Well, that's devastating. And uh, but I, I want you to know, that, you know, because of your continued giving and your continued generosity, you know, Mike and Brian let me know that, and we said, "Well, we've got to do something for that." And so we weren't able to replace all three thousand dollars worth, but we were able to leave about one third of new tools there for them. And I said thank you to you that we would have those kind of funds that are sitting in a place where we could say, you know, the best use for those funds right now is to go and continue that ministry, even though the devil stole those tools, we're going to give them back. And so grateful for that. Thank you. Folks, uh, uh, I noticed that it's 1025. And that's okay. It's okay. Um, you know, you can look at the title of the sermon this morning and say, see the power of apolog- apologetics and friends. Just let, let me tell you this. We're not going to talk about friends today. But don't take that first point. We'll, we'll, we'll do it another time. But really, this is, this is an important message as we've gone through this family series. It really is very important. And so, apologetics, that whole name that might throw you, wow, that's more than a three syllable words, apologetics. What is that? Why is it important for us today? But I, I want to remind you of something that's incredibly obvious to all of you. We're living in incredibly different times, to speak that the least. Okay? What is going on in our world? It seems like things are unraveling right in front of our eyes. And yes, it is different than five years ago. It's different than ten years ago. It's different than forty years ago. It is different right now. I can't completely explain it. All I can do is observe it, and things out there aren't good, and they don't seem to be getting any better. There is an onslaught like we haven't seen in years where the truth is on the line. What is truth? People right now are reveling in the fact that they say, you have your truth, you have your truth, you have your truth. Folks, that doesn't work on any level. But that's what's going on in our world. You know, when I was in high school Bible class, I remember my teacher saying this, and some of you might even remember a song by this title. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And, and for me, in my spirit at that time, I heard that and I thought, okay, okay, that's good enough for me. But you know what? I would suggest that it's not working right now. Why? Well, there are more and more churches that have different understandings of different things. So when God said it, God said what? Some people will ask. Because you say God said this, and you say God said this, and you say God said this. And there's a tremendous amount of confusion and blurring of what actually is the truth. I mean, really, are there multiple truths that we can have with the Scriptures? Or does it boil down to what this person believes, and that person believes, and this church believes, and that church believes. There has to be truth, folks. There has to be truth. So, can there be so many truths out there regarding the things we are told to hold so closely? You know, it's interesting. I got a letter, uh, it was probably a couple years ago, on something completely different. It's a nice letter from a former member of this church. I held on to it, as I do with most letters, and then I happened to come across it this week, and I thought, well, this is very interesting. This really wasn't the essence of their letter, but it was referring to their place in this church many years ago. 
names are important. But here's what they said. I was once a member of the First Reformed Church, and um, the pastor that they're referring to, they said, he was not always appreciated. I suspect because he was a whole lot smarter than most of the congregation. They said it, not me. I listened carefully, and when I found something that conflicted with my personal beliefs, my dad sent me to him to explain things. One notable one was the conflict between my fifth grade science book and the first chapter of Genesis. He explained that a day did not necessarily mean 24 hours. It could mean millions of years. And then he said, but don't argue with your Sunday school teachers because no one may have explained this to them. For a debate of 24 hour days right now. What I believe when we move away from, from explaining what the Bible says something is true, we have no reason to interpret day different than 24 hours. What we do is we inject doubt into our kids. We inject doubt into our family. So let's go with what the Bible says. And let's not tell our kids. Doubt their Sunday school teachers, and let's make sure our Sunday school teachers are teaching the Bible. The letter goes on. The other memorable explanation was when he told me that I did not, that I need not fear that I would never see my beloved neighbor because he never went to church. You don't have to go to church to be saved, but don't tell anyone. Now, some of you might be sitting there and saying, well, that's the truth. You know you don't have to go to church to be saved. You're right. I suppose. I guess I don't have to go home to my wife to be married, right? Would you, would you find it weird if I lived in another town in another house and never went home to my wife? And I said, we're married. We're married. I love her. I love her more than any woman in the world. Why don't you live with her? Don't make such a big thing about that. Well, so what we do is we inject doubt into him when we say stuff like that. We've got to be careful with these sorts of things. There is truth there. It's been be said. Because what that does is that affects a person, a family, and the generation around that when we instill doubt in our kids about what I think Scripture is very clear on. See, Jesus warned about this when he was ministering to his disciples, when he was talking about being the good shepherd. You know, there's a good shepherd, of course, that goes up against a bad shepherd. Here's what Jesus said in John 10, 10. He says, A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come to the day that have life and have it in abundance. The thief, the devil, is doing a whole lot of stealing right now. I hope that you can see that. I hope that you can recognize that the thief is stealing. Stealing from our families, stealing from our kids, stealing all over the place. The thief is committed to deceit. What are, will, what are we going to be willing to say enough already, especially as it relates to our children? This is big stuff. So what I'm going to say right now is going to be offensive. Buckle your seatbelt. How does a child know the importance of going to church if his parents only go to church one to two times a month when it is actually convenient? You know what happens? The kids won't. How does a child know the importance of reading the Bible if they never witness their mom or their dad reading the Bible? Answer? They won't. How does a child learn to prioritize prayer if their parents don't pray and don't pray with them? They won't. How does a child learn to prioritize sexual purity if their parents don't teach it, model it, and require it? They won't. 
How does a child learn what a thriving marriage is if all they observe from their mom and dad is that they're sniping at each other all week long? They won't. Why do we do what we do here at church? If we are not seeking to build deeply rooted families at whatever the cost, what are we doing? If when Jesus' mandate says, go and make disciples, doesn't start here, and we're serious with it here, with the families that we have here, how on earth can we go out there and do it? You know, the very beginning of the series, I read this verse from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Listen. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe. Paul talked to Timothy. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. What does Paul say to Timothy right away? Continue in what you have learned. Younger, you've learned this as a younger kid, a younger boy. Continue in that. You've learned all those stories. And then firmly believe, or some versions say, convince what you believe here and then what you are convinced of now. This is where we have to go. We teach these kids all these Bible stories. We can teach them apologetics. We can teach them doctrine and theology. And their minds might have all this swirling around with them as they're little. But then gradually, as things go on, they become convinced. That's the goal. Convinced. Convinced. That's what we want for adults. Some adults have never arrived at the place where they're convinced. Because if they were convinced, they would actually do what God requires if we're convinced. So many of us aren't convinced. That's eh, nice. Stories, nice. Inspirational services. Like the music. Hot day. Church is air conditioned. I'll be there. They're not convinced yet. We're to be among the convinced. We can't disciple families if we're not convinced. Hmm. So, as a church, for our leadership, that includes me, we have to help bring clarity to the Scriptures. After all, if there's a fog right here in the pulpit, there's a mist out there. So we have to have clarity. Look at what Peter said. Peter says this, But in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So the first question begins, do you have a hope that's within you? Do you have a hope in the midst of all this chaos in the world? Do you have a hope that Christ is on the throne, that He's coming again soon, and that He will restore all things? Do you have that hope? Because if you have that hope, people are going to ask you about it, and you're going to need to explain it. Why you are convinced. If you have a hope that in light of somebody close to you or maybe even you are going to die, that you have a hope that there is something beyond the grave. And so with confidence, you face death because you know you're going to go be with Jesus. People are going to ask you about that. And Peter says, be ready. Be ready to tell them why you have this hope. That's what we're all supposed to be ready. Well, only the convinced can give them because they actually know What's there? So, let's face it, though, folks. Doubts come up, especially for our kids. And our kids will not always communicate to us their doubts. So I've said a couple times already, doubts oftentimes come up with kids around middle school. The research has shown we often lose the heart of middle schoolers, but they continue to go and practice the rituals that their parents do, but then actually when they go to college, then they leave. They leave the church, they don't come back. But they're losing, we're losing their heart in middle school. So this becomes very important. How do you prepare your children to handle these doubts? Are we convinced that there are answers to the things that they have doubts about? Now folks, I've come to believe this. I say this all the time. I believe this Bible has the answers. I really do. I believe that there is an unbelievable amount of clarity about everything we need to know about. I believe God didn't sell us up short. Oops. 
I forgot to mention that. No, it's all here. It's all here. Do you believe that? Do you believe that there are actually answers in here for life issues today? Because if you don't believe it, what you do is then you start to communicate fog. When we communicate fog out there, then our children, again, they get foggy as well. There are answers here for us. Now, let's look at a couple of scriptures that Jesus talked about. Mark 12, 13, 23, he said this. Then if anyone tells you, see, here is the Messiah, see that, do not believe it. The false Messiahs and false prophets will arise and will perform signs and wonders to lead astray. If possible, the elect. And you must watch. I have told you everything in the day. So Jesus was telling his disciples already, hey, there's going to be false teachers that are going to come up. There's going to be false teachers that are going to be around. And they are going to be around then, and they are around now. Do we recognize them? Are we amongst the convinced enough that even when we turn on the TV and see somebody who's might be standing behind the pulpit, we can recognize the truth from not the truth? These teachers will show up in pulpits and teach wrong. Why do they do this? Well, they're accomplishing the devil's work, the lie, and the steal, and the destroy. There are churches out there with big steeples on them. There are churches out there with smoke machines on the stage and the greatest of technology. And some have great tradition. And they are actually synagogues. Jesus used to do it in his letters to the seven churches in Revelation. We should not be surprised at this. Jesus warned us just because it has a steeple doesn't mean it's a true church. Just because they have a big budget and a lot of bodies in their seats doesn't mean it's a true church. What's going to determine that? John 16, 1 to 4, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I have told you these things that when their time comes, you will remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. Jesus tells his followers, then and now, you're going to be under attack. And folks, if we're worried about our reputation, we won't care about the truth. If we're worried about our if I'm worried about my reputation, there's a whole lot of more fluffy things that I can talk about here this morning. Make you feel all good like it's a Hallmark card service. But we as pastors, we as teachers, we as Christians, we have to lay our reputation aside if we want to preach, teach, model the truth. It doesn't mean that we're not loving. It doesn't mean we can't be fun. But the truth is going to come with consequences. Bringing the truth to an anti-Christian world in which we live in is tough. Raising children to do this is tough because they are being bombarded with other Truth. If we don't, if we don't teach them the truth, they go out there. The other truths are coming at them with big guns. See, it's not enough to teach our children simply what to believe, but we must also teach why they believe it. And that's the young. We teach them more the what. Okay, that's the way their minds are wired. The what. And then as they grow up, they can have a greater understanding of the why. It's the why that actually makes things stick inside of them. I have to say in my own life that I always felt behind as I began to be a 10, 11, 12-year-old that I, that I didn't know the Bible very much because it really wasn't taught in my home. I was, uh, I was not a Christian school or anything like that. And so as I got around others, I thought, well, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know who that is. And so then I started catching up kind of on my own. I took it seriously. I started reading books. I started reading my Bible more. And so I started learning the what. But it wasn't until I was really taught the why, the why that I believe, did my faith actually start to really stick. 
because just knowing and memorizing the Ten Commandments didn't do it. Knowing multiple verses of Scripture didn't do it, although I think a lot of people are very proud. Knowing the Ten Plagues, memorizing all the things of Judah, none of that really mattered unless I knew the law. And so just briefly, let me talk to you about apologetics. First of all, apologetics doesn't mean apologize. Okay? Apologetics simply means this, defense. Defense. So when you see books that are called apologetic books, they're about the defense of the faith. They help explain the why. Our kids, teens, college students, young adults, and adults need to be given every week, every week, the reasons why we believe what we believe. Every week. We gotta be explaining it here, we gotta be explaining it in our youth group, our children's ministries, everywhere. Why do we believe what we believe? We've got to address vital questions like this, and believe me, there's a sermon for each of you. How do we know that Jesus existed in history? Is there evidence beyond the Bible? Well, I can tell you right now there is, yes. Can we trust the gospel? How about the Bible? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. But we've got to give this. We've got to give this to our kids. How do we know that Jesus is the only way? And other truths are always saying he's one of the ways. How do we know that Jesus is the only way? How could so many good people be wrong? Because the Bible says that. And we need to give evidence of that. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? How do we know? Does it really matter? How can a good God allow suffering? That's a question that often puts many people in doubt. There's answers. How can a loving God send people to hell? Tough question. Brings about a lot of doubt. But there's answers. Why are there good people who aren't Christians and bad people who say they are? Sometimes the meanest people people have met in their life go to church. It's not a good testimony. Maybe stop the people. Oftentimes when you see people that used to go to church and they don't go to church, they have a reason. And the reason is just oftentimes very sad. Certainly not enough to sacrifice their eternity for, but they have the time to observe things in churches that aren't good. These are new questions that I just asked folks, and we can't ignore them. If we don't address them, people will not know the truth, and they will believe something else. Believe me, for every one of those questions, the devil who comes to lie, steal, and destroy has another answer. It's just out there, all over the place. If we don't provide the answer, the devil's got one. So how do we speak to doubt? Let me just give you a little brief strategy. In this thin soaked world, how do we speak to doubt? Well, the first thing we've got to tell our kids is that this, kids, people are going to question your faith. Well, that sounds hard. This is real. People are going to question your faith. There are going to be people around you. Sometimes at school they're going to question your faith. Sometimes at work they're going to question your faith. Sometimes your friends are going to question your faith. It's just going to happen. Give them specific arguments so that they can know the biblical answers to the questions that are going to come. You know, a couple summers ago, my wife and I went out to uh, the Tracy Museum of the Ark, and a lot of you have done that in Kentucky. Great trip, great trip. You know what's so great about it? You know, kids can enjoy it, and what they get there is answers, 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 answers. And it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful experience. Okay, it's not, you know, crazy rides, you know, to, you know, adventure land or something like that. But it really is stimulating. I strongly recommend you take your families out to places like that and get plugged into those sorts of resources. I wish I would have had that 30 years ago. We only visit the Museum of the Bible. We hear good things about that in Washington, D.C. You know, everybody can't go to Israel, but one of the reasons we have such a passion to take people to Israel is they get answers. You know, when you're walking, you're seeing, you're experiencing, you're hearing from a trained guy different things. What that does is some people's hearts are removed down from them. And it becomes such an affirming to the Bible trip. And, you know, folks, quite frankly, because we're trying to equip people more. This is one of the reasons we're overhauling our library. We're overhauling our library for the purpose of putting the stuff in there, the books in there, to help equip people in their faith. That's the most important thing that we can do as a church. 
We want to do everything we can to equip families, children, and adults to know what and why they believe. That's a paramount importance. And then another part of the strategy is to solicit the response. When we talk to our kids about this, have them give a response. Talk to them. Even quiz them a little bit on it. We know how to respond to these things. Talk about it together. Scott Bettis, who wrote the book that's still available in the lobby that I highly recommend for all of you about uh, disciple making families, he said this uh, when he's talking about talking with his children. He says, At some point in your walk with God, you may have some doubt. After all, we can't see him. And we live in a world that is hostile to him. When that happens, let's talk about it. There are answers out there. Don't let those doubts nag you. We will find the answer together. So we should expect our children to have questions. We should expect our children to even have doubts once in a while. That's okay. Find the answers together. And then watch those doubts begin to fade. Let's do that with our families. Let's do that in our church. And this is why, folks, we're trying to make a concerted effort. The elders of this church are trying to do this because this is so important. We must have a greater commitment to discipleship than ever before in the history of First Church. Within that, we must have a greater commitment to systematically reading the Bible than ever before. Within that, we just led 14 people. They're finishing up their second year of a program called the Catechumenate. And they are now being challenged to reproduce that in other people in the church. That's why we do these things. Within that, we will continue to teach theology regularly at our church. People need to know that. Within that, starting in a couple of weeks, we're going to begin a journey through the Book of Romans that's going to take us into 2024. And it very well may be the most significant journey we take together as a church. Within that, we will move to require of our elders who are going to be coming in to be the elders of the future a stronger biblical and a theological grounding to become elders because it's so vitally important. And dear people, it's not all about knowing. It's not all about knowing. But please, we can't forget about knowing. It's also about being. See, as you experience the transformation, Romans 12, the transformation to the renewing of our minds, what that does is it should translate into a being, a passion for the Word of God, a passion for the truth. It starts with knowing, moves to being, and then goes to doing. That's what we need to be as families. That's what we need to be as a church. This is so important. So let me close with this. It's Memorial Day weekend. You know, Memorial Day weekend, I haven't done it yet, but I'll probably put it in the DVD player. Well, DVD player, you don't know what that is. So that's what it is. I like to uh, like the city of the band of brothers. It's about easy company. Well done. Uh, World War II. And I really, uh, it's, it's just good for me to be reminded of the tremendous sacrifice of so many in that war represented by this particular company of men. You know, one of the things that they were told at that time, and some of you lived through this time, you know, if, if, if we send a barrage of people to this beachhead in Normandy, that if we could take that beachhead, the, the troops, the Allied troops, continue to march forward, and we can win this war. We've got to get that beachhead. So any of you have seen that particular uh, television series or seen any other war movie, you know that that barrage, that attack at Normandy was bloody. It was awful. The enemy fire was great. The loss of life was tremendous. They got through. And the long, long story short is this. The Allied forces were victorious in the European theater. The beachhead 
You know, Jesus provided the beachhead for us on the cross when he said, It is finished. At Pentecost, we became equipped with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have all that we need. We have God in us as Christians. We have God's Word right here in front of us. Time to keep moving. Right to the end. This, dear people, is not a casual battle. Our families are at stake. Our church is at stake. Just like when they were taking that beachhead at Normandy, they kept saying, keep moving forward. Keep moving. Don't compromise with the world. Keep moving. Don't be more concerned with your reputation than the mandate of what God has commanded us to do. And then, because we know it from Scripture, one day Jesus is going to come back and He's going to completely finish up and all the enemies of Him will be gone, destroyed, completely. Guaranteed. Comes from Him. And if we die before that, and many of us will die before that, but may we die having pursued the great commandment and the great commission to do the things that the Lord has asked us to do, so that when we die, we are welcomed with those wonderful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. As we get better than that, that's the promise that we live in. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we once again thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that your word really does leave us with no doubt when we continue to dwell in it. Lord, with the word in front of us, with you inside of us, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, we have all that we need to understand and then to teach and to model and to help remove any doubt. Lord, may we be that church that seeks to do that. And Lord, if there's people sitting here that today that may, may have been here many times, but don't count themselves among the convinced yet, I pray that maybe today might be a day that they say, I need to take that step. I need to stop playing. There's a battle going on. And I need to lift up my sword, of which is the Word of God, and get in this fight. Oh Lord, may we fight for our children. May we fight for our families. May we fight for our church with all that you've given to us. Because there's a devil out there that's lying, stealing, and destroying. And we don't want to take it anymore. So may we humbly, lovingly, and very aggressively go for it.